So open up to Mark chapter 9. And there were two verses in chapter 9 that I did not preach upon last week because they really do not fit with the context of the preceding verses. The title of today's sermon is Salted with Fire. Salted with fire, and that is one of the phrases that we will look at in a moment. We'll be preaching on Mark 9, verses 49 and 50. Father, as we open up your word, we pray that you would help your word to be understood. Lord, these are difficult verses. They're not easy verses. And we ask that you would enlighten us to the truth of, of your word and to the the truth that you have for each person in here today. Father, we know that your word is to not go forth void, but it is to return back uh, to you to accomplish the work that you send it forth to do. And we pray, Father, that your, your word would soften our hearts today, that your word would make us more uh, in line with your truth. We ask that your word would not harden our hearts today, Lord, because that is one of the things that your word does, is it harden hearts towards you. But we ask today that this word would truly make our hearts softer towards you who is glorious. And Father, I ask that you'll help me to just preach that which you want pre preached this morning. In the glorious name of Jesus, amen. I've said it a few times already, but the text that we are looking at today, those two verses, are considered by most scholars to be two very difficult verses for understanding. Um, I looked through a, I don't know, dozen, half dozen, whatever it was, um, number of commentaries and scholarly works concerning Mark, and I could not find one scholar or one commentator or one of these educated people who said, oh, it's easy. These verses mean... There's not one of them that says what these verses clearly mean. Because it's not real clear. Now most of Scripture, most of the Bible, you can read it and you can get a fairly direct and clear understanding of what is being said. Most of the Bible is pretty plain. I mean, it might take a little bit of work on your part, but it's pretty plain. It's, it's easy to understand most of Scripture. But not these two verses. They're really hard. Now, my first thought was, well, in the past, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, I, I mean, I may have just overlooked these verses and just breezed past them and kind of mumble them and pretend like they weren't there and just kept going. I mean, that's what some of us do. We get to something hard in the Bible and we just like, well, okay, I, I don't need to deal with that. I'll just move on. It's too hard to understand. The problem is so many people use that as an excuse as to why they don't pick up their Bibles. We're not going to do that today. We're not going to just breeze on past these things. Because every word of the Lord is precious and beneficial to us. Every word of Scripture, even if we don't have a full grasp or a full meaning, it's important to us. The Holy Spirit put those verses there. Jesus uttered those verses because they are important to us. So we're going to look at these two verses, Mark 9, 49 and 50. And this is what Jesus says. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. We'll read them again. For, who, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. 
Now the most obvious place to start there is the word salt. Because we have two verses and six references to salt. But I'm not going to start there. I'm not going to start by just giving a dissertation on salt. That will come in a moment. I think the more obvious place to start is, okay, we have two verses, but there are really five statements being made in those two verses. And they're, they're in some ways they're separate statements, other ways they tie together. But statement one is basically this. Everyone will be salted with fire. That's the first statement Jesus is making. Everyone is going to be salted with fire. Thus I name the sermon, Salted with Fire. The second statement that he makes is salt is good. So everyone will be salted with fire is statement one. Statement two is salt is good. Now the third statement he makes, he makes it in the way of a question, in the form of a question. It is this. If the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? So that's a question. That's the third statement that he makes. Um, if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? The fourth statement comes in the form of a command. Have salt in yourselves. Have salt in yourselves. And the fifth statement, again, is in the form of a command, and it's the only statement that doesn't have salt in it, and it says, be at peace with one another. So we got all this saltiness, and then he says, oh, by the way, be at peace with one another. I mean, we can look at each statement separately to some degree and then see how they relate to one another. And I think that's the best way for us to somehow get some kind of an understanding that we can apply to our own lives when we walk out these doors today. I mean, isn't that why you guys come here? It's not to listen to me, is it? Isn't it to learn something you can apply and you can take outside into the world and you can, you can be more conformed to the image of Christ by? I mean, isn't that what you come in here for? I'm not that entertaining. I don't, I don't come on stage in a unicycle. I don't drop in in a Superman costume. You know, I don't do any of that stuff, right? All I do is I get up here and I say, here's what the Bible says and let's try to understand it so we can go out and apply it to our lives. If you don't want to apply it to your life, then don't bother coming. But the reason people come is they want to apply this. So statement one, everyone will be salted with fire. That's what Jesus says. Everyone will be salted with fire. Now, if you were here last week, you heard a lot of talk about unquenchable fire and worms that don't die. All right? Those were the preceding verses to where we are here. Jesus was talking about hell in all of the verses before. The six verses before it, he's talking about hell. If you guys want a sermon that will challenge you a bit and you haven't heard it, go get a copy of last week's sermon. Listen to it. It'll challenge you a bit because there is a hell and Jesus was the one that talked about hell more than any other person. Now, it is true that many will suffer in hell's fire. That is true. It's a true statement. We can't deny it. Scripture says that. But the fire that Jesus is talking about today that people will be salted with is actually not the same fire he was talking about last week. Okay? Today Jesus is no longer talking about fire as a form of eternal punishment as he did last week speaking of Hades or of hell. Today he's actually talking about a fire that he considers to be a good fire. A good fire. How do we know it's good? Why? Here's how we know it's good. Because he ties that word salt in with fire. He says everyone's going to be salted with fire. And by the way, salt is good. So he's right there equating that this fire is good fire because salt is good. So we have five statements, four of which reference salt. So I guess we have to address in some way the subject of salt. I mean, we all know salt. It comes in a little white shaker and you put it on you know, your, your food. Um, it's a good time to ask, you know, like, what else does the Bible say about salt? Is salt mentioned elsewhere in the Bible? Anybody have a clue? 
Okay. So it is mentioned elsewhere. So I wanted to look at some of the places today where salt is mentioned. One of the first places is, is in the law, and it's in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. And this is what God commands of his people in Leviticus 2.13. He says this, Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. So Jesus, or God, is commanding his people, when they bring an offering forward, make sure that they have salted it, because it says, do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out. Salt of the covenant, that's kind of weird. I never thought salt and covenant went together. But then there's other places. Numbers 18, 19. Again, God says, All the offerings of the holy gifts which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as a perpetual atonement. Or, as I'm sorry, as a perpetual allotment. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord to you and your descendants with you. Two verses where God is commanding salt be part of the, uh, the offering. And in both cases, salt is equated with, it's, it's, it's made similar to an everlasting covenant. It's kind of odd. And then in 2 Chronicles 13.5, it reads... Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kinship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? By a covenant of salt. I mean, honestly, how many people knew that there was a salt covenant in Scripture? I mean, we think of the covenant in Jesus' blood. We think of the covenant related to... Um, the rainbow where God made a covenant with his people not to destroy them again. I mean, we think of some of these covenants. We don't think of a covenant of salt. But from many Old Testament passages, we learn that offerings were to be seasoned with salt before they were presented to the Lord. And in, all, in every case, it's because salt represents everlasting covenant. Salt represents everlasting covenant. So the next question would be, why was salt chosen as a picture of, an, of a perpetual covenant? Why is salt chosen? Why wasn't pepper chosen? Why wasn't sugar chosen? Why was salt chosen? Well, it's because one of the things that salt does very well is it preserves things from decay and corruption. Salt is a method of preservation. Preservation makes things last longer. Thus, salt is related to a lasting covenant. It's a picture of it. There are many societies in our world even still today without refrigeration. There are many people living without some of the modern things that we have in our society. I mean, if, if you watch something, like I, Marilyn and I watched something on PBS once about the, I, I forget, Plymouth Colony or something, and, you know, they're salting their fish, they're salting their meat. And, and what they're doing is, because moisture often carries bacteria and such, they will put salt on their products, and that salt will cause through osmosis the, the water and the moisture and the, the impurities to come to the surface where it can be kind of scraped off. You know, kind of like my drinking cup earlier. It had a level of stuff that needed to be cleaned off before I drank water from it. The problem is I didn't do it properly. Um, but you know what I mean? It, spoilage comes often from the impurities that are left in the, in the food or in that item due to moisture being there. So salt dries that moisture out and helps the food 
to last longer. It, it, it preserves the food. So that's what salted pork is, you know, and different things like that, salted fish. So that's one of the reasons salt is good. Salt is good. And that's one of the reasons it represents an everlasting covenant is because it helps things to last longer. Now, another reason that salt is good, which is actually the second statement, is because salt makes tasteless foods flavorable. I mean, it's much better to eat a salty food, folks, in most cases, than an unsalty food. I mean, when Marilyn and I went to Italy a few months back, one of the regions we visited was known for its saltless bread. Anybody ever have saltless bread? It's horrid! I mean, you've got to have something to dip it in because it just, ah, oh, it's horrible. Salt is good. Now, why is salt used in these passages? Well, I mean, what's salt representing here in terms of flavor? Why, what do you think? I mean, it's, I think of it this way. Saltless bread is really similar to our having a flavorless relationship with God. It's just like saltless bread. It's bland. A bland relationship with God. I mean, you don't really put anything into it. You just kind of let it sit there. Oh yeah, I know he's there and I'm here. And I mean, Jesus did not shed his blood so that we could be all humdrum towards God. He didn't. Jesus didn't die on the cross for us so that we could have this tasteless, bland relationship with God, nor that we would continue in our decay or corruption either. I mean, so salt is good. It brings taste to a relationship. It brings, you know, taste to our lives. And it also protects us from further decay and corruption. I mean, I was thinking, you know, religion by reflex. That's, that's something new. Re religion by reflex. Mindless religious practice is like salt that has lost its flavor. I mean, you know, when Jesus says, what happens if the salt becomes unsalty? What happens is you get mindless religious practice. You get religion by reflex when the salt loses its saltiness. So verse 49, for everyone will be salted with fire. Now, that everyone there, in its context, is not referring to everyone in the general sense. Because being burned in hell and being salted with fire are two different things. So what Jesus is saying is, okay, we've already got through this whole burning in hell and fire destroying and bringing destruction. Now, I'm just going to say, well, everyone, that means you disciples in this room and anyone who follows me, you're going to be salted by fire. You're not going to be consumed by the fire. You're just going to be kind of salted with it, tinged, touched by it. Those whom Christ saves, he salts with fire, and it's a method of preserving them until the day of his coming. It's a method of, of prolonging and keeping them in the covenant of God by doing this. Now, unlike the preceding verses here where fire is a destructive uh, energy, in this case, Jesus is saying is that the fire is just going to do a lot like what salt does. It's going to help preserve. It's going to help purify. You know, so everyone's going to be salted with fire. It's going to preserve us from further decay and from further corruption in this life. And it's going to put a little bit of taste and flavor in our relationship with God. The Lord does not save us and stop there. As soon as we are saved, he, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives 
and begins to work. It's called sanctification. So consider salt a bit of sanctification, where we are purified, where we are made more holy by the Holy Spirit working in our lives. You know, Jesus saves a person, and then he entirely changes the course and direction of their lives. He turns them to him and away from that which they used to be so comfortable with. I mean, last week Jesus quoted the final verse of Isaiah, and that's where he got the phrase about unquenchable fire and worms that do not die. And today Jesus seems to also be referring to the final chapter of Isaiah. Because the verse that came before, a couple of verses before, the worm never dying, and unquenchable fire, in Isaiah 66, verses 20 and 21, there are these words written, and they are written about those who will be blessed by the day of the coming of the Lord. And this is what it says, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering, remember we go all the way back to the grain offering, Leviticus having to have salt in it, being salt seasoned, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, I, God says, will also take some of them for priests and for Levites. So we see this kind of picture in Isaiah where Jesus is in that last chapter. We kind of see this picture where God is bringing forth the offering, where God is bringing forth some who will be priests and Levites, some who, like the offering of the people of Israel, will be salted. Well, I start hearing that sort of thing, and immediately I go to Peter, because we preached on Peter, um, went through First Peter and Second Peter, and Peter tells us that we are, in fact, already priests, part of a holy and a royal priesthood, a, whole, a royal nation. We already are priests. So we see in Isaiah, Jesus alluding to um, making people priests and Levites, and now we hear that we already are priests, part of a royal nation. It's part of that life-transforming grace and that which accompanies it. Now the underlying truth here is that through the new covenant of Jesus Christ's blood on the cross, we ourselves have become an offering or a sacrifice that Jesus has sprinkled with the salt of preservation and has seasoned with fire that he might present us to his Father in all glory. Remember, we're, the Bible says in Ephesians that we are the work of his hands. We are his trophy. We are his workmanship. So this whole kind of picture here about being salted with fire and Jesus referring to offerings and everything else, it's really kind of a picture that Christ saves us and then he, he seasons us with fire. He makes us more tasteful and everything else and he gives us to the Father as a, a gift to his glory. You know, and we see that because we see in Scripture that we will be presented and, the, and then the Father will present Christ with his bride. I don't understand all of it, but it's a big picture. You know, we're part of something really big, folks. Not because of our choosing, but because of his doing. And it's just, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, those are some very wonderful thoughts. I mean... When I sit down and I contemplate at times what Christ has done, what God has done and accomplished on my behalf, I'm just amazed by it. I'm amazed by it. I see, you know, I see the pathetic creature. I see Golem in the mirror. But he has taken that creature and given that creature just life and abundant life and, and things that I don't deserve. And somehow we're all presented as an offering to the Father as to what He has done so Christ gets the glory for His doing? I mean, we're a bunch of ugly folks and, and, he, and Jesus with the work of the Holy Spirit makes us something pleasing to the Father. I mean, I just, I can't comprehend it, but I'm so glad I'm part of it by His grace. I mean, salt cleanses and, and it purifies by bringing impurities to the surface. 
And that's the same thing that fire does. If anybody has ever seen a jeweler at work, they'll take gold, they'll throw it into a pot, they'll heat it up, the gold will melt, and all of the impurities will rise to the surface because they're, they're lighter weight than the gold, and then they'll scoop it off and it's called dross. And then you get pure gold to get those impurities out. You're no longer at 10 carat, now you're at 24 or something like that. So fire is used. So we'll be salted with fire. There's that fire in a good sense. I mean, I started thinking about it. Uh, when in my life have I most lost my desire to sin? When in my life am I... When in my life does sin become unimportant to me? I mean, I'll tell you what, you know, somebody can wake up in the morning and they can just be like all ready to practice those sins that they enjoy the most. I mean, they're just, you know, I just can't wait to do it. They plan it the night ahead, you know, and all of that. But then that day they get up and they're getting all ready. And then a couple hours later, they hear, you got cancer. Or, here's your pink slip. Or your kids, yeah, yeah, your kids have been in an accident. Or something like that. Boy, the last thing on that person's mind at that point is all the sins that they wanted to partake in. That's the last thing. Sin becomes a lot less des desirous in light of suffering, in light of being salted with a bit of fire. I mean, are you going through a season right now in which you feel as if you are being salted by fire? I mean, are you going through a very trying and a difficult time in your life right now? I mean, if you're a Christian, maybe the Lord is just salting you a bit with that fire in an effort to purify you, to make you more holy. To, to bring the impurities to the surface, to bring the dross up, to get those out of your life. May he's protecting you from that love of a particular sin and the, the course it will lead you on. I mean, whatever the case, if you're being salted by fire, praise God. Because he loves you. He's doing his work in you. We are his workmanship and he will get glory for us. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. Being salted with fire causes impurities to come to the surface so they can be removed from us and from our lives. There are some wonderful Old Testament passages and New Testament passages. I'm just going to read through them a little bit. The first one is from Malachi. It's uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And Malachi is prophesying, God is prophesying the coming of Jesus. And he says this, See, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like a cleansing lye. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them with gold, like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. See how that works? It makes us better. A little bit of the heat, a little bit of the salt makes us better. Zechariah 13.9 I will put them into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Isaiah 48.10 Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. We have that old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you better. That's what God's talking about. And then 1 Peter 1, seven, The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by far, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, your tested faith is going to praise 
give praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, there are many verses in Scripture that talk about the Lord being a refiner, a purifier. Many that speak to this principle. I mean, God brings a bit of heat into our lives at times because it makes us better and it makes us more into the image of Christ Jesus. God causes, it says in Romans, all things to work together for the good of those who believe and are called according to his purpose. But it continues to say, so that they might be conformed into the image of his Son. That's why God's causing everything to work together here. That we be conformed into the image of his Son. It's a beautiful thing. Statement one, everyone will be salted with fire. Statement two, salt is good. Why? Because salt, salt draws out impurities to the surface. Salt preserves, it cleanses. Salt adds flavor. Salt makes one thirsty. They say you can't make a horse drink. Yeah, you can. Salt the oats. Salt makes us thirsty for the life-giving water. Salt is good. Colossians 4, 6, we in this room are commanded, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So we're told to have a speech that is full of grace but yet seasoned with salt. I mean, we are to have words of grace for others, but those words should never lose their saltiness. What is their saltiness? The truth, the gospel. Speak the truth in love, we're told in Scripture. Well, what's that truth? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Our words, when it comes to the gospel, ought to have some kind of a passion to them. They ought to have some kind of a saltiness to them. They are to be words that are spoken with conviction. I mean, go out and share your faith. I mean, just, I'll give you two examples. Well, you know, I, I guess, I, I, I suppose you, you ought to repent and believe. If you want to. Because God loves you. I mean, that's not salty. That's mushy. Whoever wants to hear that sort of delivery when it comes to the gospel, what kind of delivery do we get in the scripture? Paul, he's, on, he's in Athens. And there's all these false gods around him. And Paul is in Athens in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. He's up on Mars Hill. He's, he's overlooking the, the pantheon and on all the, this, everything up there on the mountain. And he says this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. I mean, he's just, you know, put some fire into it. Put a little salt in your voice. You see the, the difference? Be passionate about this. Have some salt in yourselves. Let's put some salt behind the words of truth that others may repent and believe the gospel we preach. In speaking to we, his disciples, to all of us, in the parallel passage in Matthew 5.13, Jesus says this, You, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I'll tell you what, you hear those preachers out there, you hear people sharing their faith and it's all that, well, Jesus loves you and uh, yeah, if you want to turn from your sin, it's okay. You know, all that stuff gets trampled underfoot by the truth. Men, men will eat that stuff up. They'll find so many loopholes in that. Oh, Jesus really loves me? Then why did this happen in my life? And they'll find all these loopholes. But if we just go in and we say, God has commanded that all men repent. That's got a lot more flavor to it. A lot more truth. It's that salt that we are to carry because we are the salt of the earth. Christ living in us makes us salty. Here in Mark, Jesus makes that third statement in the form of a question. If the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? There is no way to make 
something that has lost its salty taste salty again. Except maybe to season it with more salt. Or to salt it with fire. Tell you what, in my own life, the times that I have lost my passion about Christ, something's gone on in my life after that that made me draw real close to him and I got a lot more passionate. You know what? God is like that. God wants us close to him. God wants us to have passion in our relationship. God wants a flavored relationship with us. He doesn't want us to be a humdrum and taking things for granted. Typically the time that I take the gospel for the most granted, what will follow is I'll fall into some kind of a sin and it's like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You even save sinners like that, like me. The key here, though, is to not let the salt lose its saltiness in the first place. That's the key. Y'all, let's stay salty is what Jesus is saying. Y'all want to stay salty. Do not become unsalted, my brothers and sisters. Keep your faith seasoned and alive. I'll tell you what, I mean, it's just coming to me now, not really related, but to some degree. Has anybody noticed over the last 10 years how planters' peanuts have changed? You used to be able to buy a planter's peanuts and they were salty. They actually had flavor. Now you go to the store and they are garbage. It's like eating cardboard. Let's remain salty. Let's have some impact. Let's, with the gospel, make people think about it. Let's have flavor in our relationship with God. I mean, the last thing of planters I bought, I took two bites and threw it away. It's not even good to eat. It's not good. I don't think a dog would like the stuff. How can a Christian remain salty? How do we remain our, our salty selves? There are really four ways that I see in Scripture. The first one is we keep our eyes upon Christ and the gospel. We, we strive for truth. Somebody will say something, and we don't say, well, it's probably true. We go and we check out the Word of God to see if it is true. We strive for it. We want to know the truth of Christ. I mean, how many of you pray like me, and I hope you do. Lord, I could be wrong on this. Change my thinking. Let me know what truth really is. Number one way to remain salty is to keep your eyes upon Christ and upon the gospel. Keep focused on the fact of sin and salvation. It's so necessary. Number two way is to stay in the Word of God and continue to pray. We got to stay in here. We got to pray. Folks, if this is sitting on your shelf, if it is going to be sit, sitting on your bookshelf or in the backseat of your car until next Sunday, you're doing yourself an injustice. Read it. Learn. Understand. Say, Lord, I don't understand fully. Make me to understand. Pray. I can't tell you how many weeks I struggled just over these two verses before finally it's like, okay, praise God. Keep digging. Stay in the Word. Continue to pray. Number three, you want to stay salty? Get around other believers. Just keep being around other believers. You know? D don't forsake the fellowship. Don't forsake the fellowship of the gathering, we're told in Hebrews. True believers, they get around other believers and worship together. And number four, witness to others. That'll make you salty. Go past your fear. Go past that, that scaredness to death feeling. And just open your mouth about Jesus. And I'll tell you what, it's going to make you salty. It's going to make you salty. You, you can't be lukewarm anymore. You can't be bland. The fourth statement that Jesus has made, he says, Have salt in yourselves. That's what this is about. You guys be salty. Me be salty. Have it within yourselves. So four f statements about salt, and then all of a sudden, it's like a total change in direction. Oh yeah, statement five. 
be at peace with one another. Salt, 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 be at peace with one another. We're going to end this morning with that phrase, be at peace with one another, because it seems to be kind of uh, an odd way to end a talk on salt. I mean, why would Jesus talk about salt, 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 and then all of a sudden say, and by the way, be at peace with one another? I mean, if Jesus had been talking about sugar, then we'd say, oh, I see how sugar leads to our getting along better. It makes for a sweeter relationship. Or what about another spice like ginger? Jesus could have been talking about ginger, and we'd say, oh, I understand. Gingerly speech helps us to get along, to be at peace with one another. But salt, you know, we don't equate salt with sweetness. So what does salt have to do with our living together as one big happy family? I think there's a lot to, it has to do with it. Who are some of the most arrogant people out there? Who are some of the most bold people out there? Who are some of the most rude people out there? There are people that have never been salted with fire. They've just had their own perfect little life and everything's just been going really well and they are hard to get along with. You know, get sick and have people come around you like Job's friends that have never had any sickness in their lives. Never seen it, and they'll be giving you all kinds of silly things that won't produce peace in you. Unless we've experienced some trying moments in our lives, unless we've been tested and have had some of our own impurities brought to the surface and cleansed away, unless we've become salted with fire, oftentimes we just won't play well with others. Oftentimes, salt and fire make us a better playmate. So we don't disrupt the peace. I mean, have you ever... I mean, the whole saying, walk in somebody else's shoes or in their moccasins or whatever it might be that's politically correct nowadays. I mean, the Bible says that we receive comfort from God so we can comfort others. That's all part of this. There is no way that I could ever have been a pastor unless I had gone through some really fiery, tested moments in my life. There is so much of me that is left on a, a bedroom floor and in dens and in cars where prayer was taking place and where, where things were coming off because I was a, oh, horrible. But God salted me with much fire. And I'm so thankful for it. And this, all of us in this room, we've been salted in one way or another by fire because that's what he does to believers. And it helps us to sit around and to overlook what that person's doing and overlook this because we see some of that stuff in ourselves. Our impurities have come to the surface and we haven't liked the smell. The spoilage. It's only fitting for Jesus to end by commanding us to live at peace with one another because peace is the natural outcome of purification and preservation. It leads to peace. Let the Holy Spirit sanctify you. Let the Holy Spirit salt you with fire. Let the Holy Spirit, let the will of God bring you through that tribulation and that trial because in the end you will have peace. I mean, there are things that he has brought us through in this room, some of us, that we can go through an awful lot just thinking back, well, he brought me through that. What, what more could, could happen to me? There you go. There's our sermon on salt this morning on those five statements and how, you know, salt really is good and how we will all be salted by fire. So let's pray. Father God, we pray that as we go forth from here today that you would help us to carry truth with us, that which we have just heard that you want us to hold on to and, per, and, and to keep in the forefront, Lord. Let us go forth and not fear those saltings with fire. Let us not go forth and fear those times where you bring our impurities to the surface, those times where you purify us, those times that you make us ready for your coming. Let us not, Lord, fear those things, but embrace 
that. Let us call out to you in prayer. Let us remain, Lord, a salty people. Let us be a people, Lord, who will speak the truth, the truth of the gospel out of love for others, Almighty God. Let us be the people you have called us to be. Father God, as we leave here today, we do so in thanksgiving. We do so just so thankful for what you have done in our lives. And we pray that you will continue to do that this coming year, 2014. You'll continue to work in our lives in even greater and greater ways that we might become more and more like your son Jesus. To the glory of your name we pray and we end this service. Amen.